Uh, hi. Uh, I'm David Gutman, JavaScriptor in chief at JSLA. I uh, also am the creator of Rambly. Uh, if you are in Rambly right now, hey. Uh, and uh, more relevant to this talk, I am the managing partner of Superstruct. Superstruct helps companies build amazing remote engineering teams. And I'm also the host of the Junior to Senior podcast, where I have interviewed 67 CTOs. Uh, engineering managers, tech leads, and senior engineers to ask them about their real-world experience on how to build software and what works and what doesn't. Um, and so uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, the, the common ways that teams uh, trip themselves up and get into trouble. So the, the three main ways that, that or areas that I'm going to talk, talk about tonight are uh, attachment issues, uh, fear of commitment, and a lack of closure. So I'm just going to just dive right in with a story. So one of my clients, they use Shopify for, uh, for their purchases. So they have online courses, and it works great. Uh, someone goes to uh, Shopify, they can place an order. Uh, Shopify, the webhook uh, hits the API, something else happens, and ta-da, uh, you have uh, a, student, a student able to access their online course. And that is all well and good until marketing wants to run a promotion. So they create like a billion test orders, but all in, you know, with different properties and formats that the back end isn't expecting. So the back end thinks that this is, you know, bad requests, sends 400 uh, HP errors back to Shopify. And what uh, some of you may not know and um, uh, wasn't known at the time is that Shopify, uh, after some unspecified number, and they, they this isn't public anywhere, they don't say what number it is, but after some number of errors like this, uh, they will just delete the webhook, just delete it. Uh, and and you won't get any more orders anymore through the webhook. And not only that, there's no notification. So this is huge amounts of fun for the for the whole company. And um, this needed to get fixed. So the webhook was put back in, but this couldn't happen again. So the backend team and one developer in particular, who's very good by the way, uh, decided that, that that the way forward was to create a queue. And so what would happen now is that when Shopify um, uh, gave an order through the webhook, uh, they would just get a 200 OK immediately. And no matter what, uh, the order would go into the queue. And if there was ever an error or any problem, Shopify would never know and never delete the webhook again. Now, uh, what this uh, developer wanted to do, because it's a node backend, was to use Bull. So if you're not familiar with Bull, Bull is a popular uh, queue package um, uh, for Node.js. And uh, they, if you look at the readme, it's the fastest, most reliable, rock solid, bestest ever um, Redis-based queue for, for Node.js. And uh, this is all well and good. Uh, and the, uh, the engineering manager, before giving it the green light, asked this developer if uh, they had considered or, or what they thought about using a more um, a commercial service so that, that maybe this wouldn't be run in-house. And what happened next is the pattern I see a lot. And uh, this developer turned into uh, a spokesperson for Bull. Uh, they just started talking about how flexible it was, that you could just configure it. It got over 300,000 downloads per week on NPM. Um, it uh, had different options for retry logic. And it was free. And um, at this point, uh, regardless of whether or not Bull was the best choice or not, what had become clear was this developer was no longer impartial. They had become attached to their idea, and they were just going to defend it uh, no matter what. Um, they were no longer thinking about uh, the problem with an open mind. And so to understand what was what's going on here, I want to talk about three studies that shed some light on how something like this can happen. Uh, 
So before we get into that, just to make sure you're still with me, uh, easy math problem. We're just going to answer this real quick. Uh, there's no trick here, and it uh, should just be really simple. So uh, a bat and a ball together cost $1.10. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Well, if you are anything like over half the students at top universities like Harvard, MIT, and Princeton, uh, your answer would be 10 cents. Is it really 10 cents? Well, this example comes from a book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Some of you might be familiar with it. It is by the uh, Nobel Prize winning psychologist and economist Daniel Kahneman. And the central theme of the book is that there are two modes of thinking, system one and system two. System one is very fast. This is your instinct, gut reaction. Uh, it is effortless. It, it happens so fast, but it is inaccurate. System two takes a lot more effort, but it's much slower. But this is where you get the accuracy. Uh, system one is what came up with that answer of 10 cents. It's very appealing. It's very intuitive, but it is also very wrong, which you can you know, verify uh, without too much, uh, too much time by just thinking about it. And the takeaway here is do not let system one drive. You have to validate what system one tells you. Uh, the answer is actually five cents, which I hope we can all do the arithmetic, arithmetic to, to figure out. Now, the reason why I bring this up is this is kind of similar to when the uh, engineer uh, brought up that bull was so great because it was free, especially in the context of, uh, at the time, uh, it was asking about Google Cloud tasks. I think I might have neglected to mention that in the, in the story. But uh, the advantage of being free is intuitively, uh, you know, it's intuitively appealing. Uh, free is better than costly. So commercial services cost money. Um, bull is open source. You run it yourself, so it is free. Um, but like the bat and the ball problem, it is something that can be validated quickly. Uh, you know, you just Google Google tasks uh, pricing, and you and you would get it. And what you would learn is that uh, the first million orders would be free, and after the first million orders, it would be another forty cents per million. So this company, uh, this you know, this client. Uh, would definitely be spending 40 cents a month if they were doing almost $10 billion in sales per year. So this is just, it's the type of thing that it's, it was clear that um, the developer was neglecting to, to put in the work to really validate uh, their reasons and it makes you wonder what else they were neglecting. So to go a little bit further into this, I want to talk about how uh, people pick solutions. And so in 1942, Abraham Luchin did an experiment where he wanted to explore how people solve problems. The problems that he was giving people were, um, I guess, what you would call water jug uh, problems. So three, uh, three jugs of, of certain volume. Uh, where you know the volume of each one, so you can see the big ones, 138 units and 66 and 21. Um, there's no markings on them or anything, so you just know the total. And then the goal is to measure out, uh, you've got unlimited water, but you want to measure out a specific volume. So in this case, you wanted to get 30. Uh, I'm not going to make you solve any more math problems. I'll just tell you uh, the answer. Uh, you would fill up the big one, and then you would pour it out into the middle one, and then you would pour it out again into the small one, dump the small one, and pour it out a uh, third time into the small one. And so what would be left over is 30. Another way of saying this is A minus B minus 2C. So here's where things get interesting. There was another similar problem that he gave to the participants. Uh, so different volumes and uh, a different ask. But this is where uh, things <laughs> this is where things diverge because half of the participants had seen the problem that I just showed you. Those participants used the same solution. They tried to do 
uh, a minus b minus 2c, which totally works. But the control group, which had never seen that before, did not use a minus b minus 2c because there's a much simpler solution, which is just b plus c. If you want 18, it's just 15 plus 3. What was going on here is that uh, it is very easy to be blinded by complicated solutions. Uh, they will blind you to simple ones just because you've been exposed to them uh, and, and just because uh, they are recent and fresh in your mind. And so that's something that has to be um, sort of guarded against because much like the intuitive answer, uh, it's not something that you would notice without um, effort. And so the third study that I want to talk about shows why this is such a big problem. In 1991, Paul Nutt studied, studied uh, 108, uh, 168 decisions, and he realized that 71% of teams uh, made decisions based on only a single uh, option. In, in other words, the decisions that they were making were, do we do this or do we not do this? And the problem with that is that the success rate was horrible. Any team that was making a decision off of just a single option, uh, only 48% of those decisions would succeed in the long run. This is worse than a coin flip. The good news is, though, that if you went to two or more decisions, uh, sorry, two or more options for the decision, then the success rate jumps way up to 68%, much, much better. Okay. So why is this and why is this a problem? And this gets to what we've been talking about before. If you are only looking at a single option, then your frame has been narrowed. What you are spending your brain power on is how can I make this work? How can I convince others that this is right? Versus if you are trying to think about how else could we do this or is there a better way. And that's how you can get to much better solutions. And it's no, it's no surprise that that leads to much better outcomes. And this is all to say that when uh, someone is attached to a solution, you can tell because they start to sound like a sales brochure. And at those points, it's really good to recognize that because it's not going to lead to good decisions. All of this, I think, is really summed up by the brilliant actor and comedian John Cleese of Monty Python fame. He gave a talk on creativity, and um, he tells the story of something that he noticed um, when working with a colleague. So this colleague, uh, in his opinion, was uh, much more talented than, than Cleese was, but uh, Cleese felt that his own scripts were way more original. So why was this? This is something that intrigued him. And what he noticed when paying closer attention to this colleague is that uh, the colleague, when faced with a problem, he would quickly find a solution. And even though Cleese suspected that the colleague didn't think it was a particularly good or original or clever solution, would just go with it. And when Cleese was in a, in a you'd find himself in a similar situation, while he might be tempted to take the easy way out and finish up by five o'clock, he would instead stick it out and he would stay with the problem until, and, and this almost always happened, he would come up with something more original. In Cleese's mind, uh, what's going on here is that when you have an unresolved problem, when you're trying to figure out the solution, you, there's some tension there and it's not comfortable. And most people are unwilling to sit with that tension, but, if uh, you persist and you can endure it longer, that's when you can reap the benefits of creativity and that's where you can find originality and uh, better solutions. So to recap uh, what we've gone over so far, um, you have to be careful about your intuitions. They can, they can be very useful, yes. They can be very fast, yes. But they need to be validated because they can get you into trouble. Also. Uh, be careful not to overcomplicate your solutions just because uh, there was something, you know, on Hacker News recently and it's fresh in your mind. That is not necessarily the simplest solution. Um, sit with uh, tension a little bit longer. That's how you can get 
uh, original um, ideas, and most importantly, don't get attached. So moving on to fear of commitment, first I want to talk about estimates. Uh, when I was an engineer working on teams, holy crap, did I hate giving estimates. You know, hey, David, when's this reporting dashboard going to be done? How should I know? How could I possibly know that? I could, I could start working on it and find out that the third party API rate limits us like crazy. And now I have to build an entire, you know, caching proxy. So I have no idea. Or tomorrow there could be a show stopping bug in production and I have to completely switch over to that. How could I possibly be able to tell you, you know, what's going to happen in the future? Obviously, this is an overreaction. And what was going on is I was just afraid of committing to any particular timeline. But what I didn't realize at the time is that it really wasn't just for their benefit. There are huge advantages uh, to uh, sticking to timelines and coming up with estimates. And they really are our best events against some of the biggest problems that can plague development. So I do want to talk about what estimates are and what they're not. Um, the problem with not providing them, and it is, has nothing to do with you know, marketing can't plan their campaign to coincide with the launch. And then finally, how estimates actually do help development when you're when you're working on a project. So as an engineer, precision is really important to me. And I and I and this would really get me into trouble because when I was asked for an estimate, I felt that I had to give a very precise answer. Um, but the truth is no one actually cared the, which hour of which day something was going to get deployed. Uh, most of the time, they just wanted to know if it was tomorrow, next week, next month, or next quarter. That was generally good enough. And uh, this, this attachment to precision is, is, is a problem. And what an estimate is, is it's a measurement. And what is a measurement? A measurement is an observation that reduces uncertainty. And that's the value. But notice it's reducing uncertainty, not eliminating it. This is why your bathroom scale doesn't have 17 significant digits. Neither does your speedometer. These things are useful without that level of precision. So are estimates. Similarly, um, similarly, Estimates don't have to be set in stone. Uh, you know, the fear was that something would come up and I would be stuck, I'd be committed to what I had said. But the truth is, if something comes up, you can revise your estimate. The additional information is, uh, is, is good to uh, put into the as estimate. As you uh, learn more information, you can reduce uncertainty further by uh, altering the estimate. And so I started to feel a lot better giving estimates when I recognized that they didn't have to be infinitely pre precise and they were not written in stone. Okay, so what kind of uncertainty does um, uh, do estimates reduce? Why, why is that uh, valuable? Well, for most teams, most companies, the most important thing is uh, setting those priorities. Um, what you work on, or what you choose to work on, is, is almost more important than how you work on anything in particular. And the reason is because if we lived in a world where we had infinite money and infinite time, we would never have to choose. But we do have to choose what we work on. And when we make a choice of working on something, we incur a cost. The opportunity cost of working on one thing is that we don't get to work on the other. So if we choose to build the character count in the comment box, then we are choosing not to build the flashy animation on the, on the login screen. And you might think that, oh, the answer to, to solve this problem is just to, to decide what we value more. Is it more important to work on uh, user engagement, or is it more important to increase conversion rate? But a better question is, what's the return on investment? And uh, you can't answer that question uh, without knowing what the cost is. Um, you need to know what the cost is. And our best guess, our best way of measuring that cost is the estimate. 
So uh, has anyone seen a project go off the rails? I certainly have. I've seen I've seen Doom projects go on for years. And so to the to the developers working on it, it probably just looks like another month or a month and a month or two and then and then they'll be good. But what I see happen a lot of the time is that they will run into some hurdle or some issue and they'll want to rewrite a core component. But by doing that, they create another hurdle, which leads to more rewrites and so on. Another pattern that I see is that projects become an excuse or a, uh, a good reason for a dev to try out some new tech that they're unfamiliar with. You know, oh, this project would be perfect for TypeScript. But what they don't realize is that if they're unfamiliar with something, then they're going to spend more time making whatever that tool is happy than actually building and finishing the feature. Um, obviously, we all have heard the phrase that time is money, and this is where estimates come into play. Estimates and timeline can act as budgets on our projects. Now, I, I totally get that no one likes a budget. I think we would all rather have a blank check. That seems way more fun. But if the name of the game is actually finishing a project and shipping, these can be very useful because these are our best defense against uh, over-engineering and high-maintenance shiny toys and rewrites. So I'm not saying never use a new framework or a new tool. I'm not saying to never rewrite. Okay, actually never rewrite. But what I am saying is to think carefully about when you do those things. They are going to incur a, a much larger time cost on a project. And if you haven't budgeted that from the beginning, it's probably not a good idea. And it's better to revisit that later. So uh, now on to the third way that teams trip themselves up. And this is lack of closure. And so if you think about an unproductive developer, what comes to mind? Is it somebody who's really lazy and is browsing Reddit and Hacker News all day? Because uh, what I think of is actually somebody who's quite busy. Uh, they tend to be a flurry, uh, you know, have a flurry of activity, but all of their pull requests um, just kind of wind up in the, the in progress column. They just, they're always working, they're always submitting pull requests, but nothing makes it over um, the finish line. It's sort of like this perpetual um, under construction type thing. And um, the reason why this happens is, uh, or let me, let me kind of stop there. Um, the reason why this is a problem is because busyness is not uh, productivity. Productivity is actually shipping. Um, work is not useful unless it is used. And so these pull requests need to get over the line. They need to get shipped. They need to get um, deployed. And so to kind of illustrate this, let's imagine there's two different approaches. Uh, so let's pretend that we have five tasks in the backlog, and each task only takes a day to complete. So hypothetical approach A, you can uh, just all the tasks are worked on simultaneously. Approach B, uh, they're worked in serial. So one is built before going on to the next one. Now, if you think about that, they are both going to wind up in the same place after a, a five-day week. Um, each one takes five days, even if they're worked in parallel. They're all going to be completed at the end of the week, and uh, same with the ones that are done in serial. Um, but if you think about what happens at day four, it's a totally different score. Uh, approach B has four of the uh, tasks completed. Those are already in the hands of the users. They are generating value, possibly even revenue, but at the very least, feedback of whether or not those are, are successful and informing future features. And so it is much more valuable to get, uh, get things over the line um, serially than it is to just shove them all in uh, at, at the end. OK, so why does this happen? Because does that, that hypothetical makes no sense. Why would anyone switch between one thing to the next without finishing anything? Does that, does that even happen? 
I mean, I'm sure uh, all of us would rather finish something completely before moving on to the to the next one. Okay, so how does this happen? In my experience, it's usually something in the form of, oh, I'm waiting on X, so I went ahead and started Y, where waiting on is a code review, QA, uh, something from product, and um, they want to be efficient. Because, look, if, if you're waiting on a code review, I mean, what else are you going to do? You should just, you know, you're going to have to do that future feature anyway, so just get started on it, right? And um, the problem with this, or, or what happens in reality, is let's imagine we have a developer. Um, they finish their pull request, and they put it up for review. So they mark, a, you know, they request a review from a teammate, uh, and then they, they go on to, to start the next feature. So that teammate is probably doing the same thing. They uh, finished up a feature, uh, you know, put it up for review, and now they're working on something else. So they're in a flow state. They are, um, you know, in the groove. And so it probably takes them a while to get to that pull request to review it. And when they do, uh, our dev, uh, so so they do, and then they and they, you know, have uh, re you know request some changes, and then the the dev. Uh, we were originally talking about, um, well, now they're in the middle of something. They're in a flow state. They're in the groove, and they don't even realize that the request, uh, you know, the changes have come back. They don't know that there's questions or comments or, or things that they need to do. And so when they finally do get to it, uh, they're now incurring a costly uh, uh, context switch, and they have to do what they can to forget all the problem that they've been working on and reorient themselves to, to what the, the original pull request was. Another problem here is that if they're anything like me, um, they're now really invested in the new thing that they're working on and they really want to get back to that, which means that they might even rush addressing the uh, problems uh, that have been brought up in the code review. This can cause another cycle of code review if they do something wrong, or it might get stuck in QA, which then leads the whole cycle to repeat itself. And so this is how, uh, even though developers are being efficient, they can wind up with one, two, three, and four uh, things all happening at once, even when they don't want to. Um, so moving ahead, let's just think about what what would be better than this? Um, you know, this, uh, this is this is kind of a phrase that I hate to see because it, it kind of it implies that developers are so powerless if they're not uh, writing code. And the question is, is it a developer's job to write code? I mean, I, I think it's actually a huge problem that this this is uh, probably for many developers. The answer is obviously yes. That's that's what they that's what they do, but it's not. Um, People don't pay us to write code. Nobody wants to pay us to write code. People want to pay us for features and uh, fixes and uh, applications. Um, they they don't. If they could get away with not paying for the code and just getting those things directly, they would love uh, doing that. So as a thought experiment, imagine that we have our hypothetical dev that we just talked about, but they only get paid when the feature is shipped and hopefully bug free. How would that differ? Um, when they mark their pull request uh, and they request a review, would they just um, sort of throw up their hands and just say like, okay, well, I guess, you know, that's, someone else will take care of it. I'll just wait around. Probably not. They'd probably be lighting up all their teammates with messages saying, hey, can you please review this? Like, it really helped me out. Can you just jump on this right now? And even if none of them were able to do it in that moment, what you might see is that they would start reviewing other people's pull requests. Why is that? Because they can see that other people have been waiting on their own code uh, being reviewed. And it's not a leap to imagine that if our developer reviews their pull requests, then out of reciprocity, uh, our developer's pull request will get reviewed and can move forward. It's also not even a stretch that when our dev's uh, <clears throat> pull request is getting reviewed, uh, that they would want to jump on and pair program while that was going on. 
Why is that? Because this would shortcut all of the back and forth of any of the issues that can arise. If the reviewer has any questions, they could be answered immediately. If they find any issues, they could be just live coded and fixed right then and there until this sails through to the next stage. What I'm getting at here is not that I think we need to change incentive structures for devs. What I'm saying is that devs do have a lot of power to reduce the cycle time and uh, move these across the finish line a lot faster if they take ownership for the entire process. I think one of the most important things uh, to consider is what does done mean? I think a lot of developers get themselves into trouble by thinking that done means that it is code complete or it's working on their machine. But that's not what this means to uh, customers, clients, and users. For them, done means it's deployed, it's shipped, it's running in production. And uh, to you know, if 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 you think that done is uh, just when it's you know running locally or something like that um, before it's reviewed, that that's kind of like having a fake finish line a hundred yards before the end of the race. It it doesn't lead to good things. And so a lot of this is changing uh, the team's mindset about what it means for something to be complete and uh, the ownership involved. So to take everything back uh, and, and sort of wrap this up, uh, teams really do get themselves into trouble if they're not making good decisions about approaches. And this usually winds up with getting attached to ideas that have not been properly vetted, have not really been thought about with an open mind. And so the best thing to do is to make sure that that intuition is validated, that uh, solutions that are not uh, overly complicated aren't, aren't just being chosen because um, they're fresh in people's minds. And uh, when you do make uh, decisions, you're choosing between multiple because that leads to, to better outcomes. And yes, it's understandable that this is difficult, that there is this tension of an unresolved problem that has that you know that you have to live with for a little while longer. But if you push through that, um, that's where better ideas, more original ideas are waiting. And the second one was that fear of commitment. And I totally understand this, um, but the truth is that when uh, you're not making estimates, you're not committing to particular time timelines, uh, you're, you're doing um, a disservice to the project. Um, that blank check is really appealing. It sounds really fun. It seems like that's much more freeing. Um, but constraints can be very powerful in defending against some of the, the biggest problems that can ail a project, namely over-engineering, uh, high maintenance shiny toys and rewrites. And finally, lack of closure. Um, busyness is not valuable. Um, we don't want to be busy. We want to be productive. Uh, we should be shipping. Um, and taking ownership of that entire uh, cycle and not just um, trying to finish early before it's over the finish line um, that's what is important. So hopefully uh, this has been helpful, maybe, or I guess even, even better is that you don't notice any of these issues on your teams and then you're doing great. Um, but if you do, hopefully this is helpful and uh, go, uh, go build something amazing. Thanks. <laughs>